All right. Yeah, we can begin. So welcome to this session, which is titled uh, Pushing Java e Outside of the Enterprise. So uh, maybe before I start, I need to give a bit of background. So I'm David Delabasse. I work at Oracle. And um, a few months ago, well, it's a, a few years ago, I had the opportunity to basically uh, renew my house. So I had a house, and I had an old building next to that. So I basically connected to those two buildings. And I thought it would be a nice opportunity to install a home automation uh, within that new house. So not only I was financially broke because of all the works, I decided to spend on top of that extra money to put out home automation uh, in that. So then I asked myself, OK, would it make sense to use Java in that context? So this is really what this session is about, about using Java e in a non-traditional enterprise uh, space. So as I told you, I'm wor I work for Oracle, so this is the mandatory uh, self statement slide. Basically, it says that everything which I will talk about might change, so don't make any purchase decision based on what I will say. The good thing is that there is no product to buy, so we can safely skip that. So the agenda for today, um, I will first explain what automation is for me. So I will give you my take on home automation, trying to explain in a few minutes what home, what home automation is about, what are the benefits, and so on. Then I will spend the rest of the time on Java E. So basically, how I've been using Java E, Java e to integrate uh, that. And before the wrap-up, I have a demo. So, first, home automation. So again, this is my take on home automation. So what, what are the features of home automation? So it's basically about having device in a home. So we have various types of device. It could be switch, it could be lights, it could be heating systems, uh, windows, uh, various types of sensors. And home automation is basically about giving you the ability to easily control those devices. So for example, let's say I have a light that I want to control from that switch but maybe the next day I want to control also that light from another switch. So it's basically giving you the flexibility to control all the device from any other kind of device. So we are talking about switch on the wall, but it can also be, uh, let's say, uh, through the internet, through your mobile phone, and so on. So once we have that, so the device set in place and you have the ability to control them, we can have things such as dashboard, having some monitoring capability. So for example, we can see uh, when someone is in a specific room. And based on that, we can take action. It's so just a different way of controlling a device. We can have dashboard, so seeing what is the average power consumption of the day, those kind of things. Something else is uh, having the ability to have scenarios, scenes, you call them whatever, there are various names for that. It's basically having more advanced uh, scenario where we can uh, change um, device. So that device triggers something, but if, uh, let's say, it's done during the night, that's something wrong, so we should do something else. So it's just, again, another example of using device uh, in a flexible way. And at the end of the day, since you need flexibility, you also have, need to have the ability to easily uh, configure uh, your systems. Because once everything is set up, uh, you might change your mind. So you might, instead of using that switch, you might want to use that other switch and so on. So that's something, flexibility, that's something you need. So what are the benefits? The benefits, well, there are various benefits, and are, um, it really depends on you are. But really, home automation is about having a better control of your home. It can improve your day to the life. I mean, if you're lazy, you have the ability to control your home uh, from your coach. But think about, for example, disabled persons. A disabled person, for a disabled person, is very key to have the ability to control the surrounding environment just from her or his wheelchair. So that's something which is key. Um, improve security. So, for example, at, uh, at my place, I have um, roof windows, automatic roof windows that close whenever there is uh, rains. But whenever, whenever there is a strong wind, those doors just remain open, and clearly that's not a good idea. So now, whenever there is a strong wind, I have the ability to also uh, automatically close uh, those windows. Improved security might also be that uh, there is someone in that specific room during the night, and clearly that's not something that you expect. So something is going on there, so something, an alarm needs to be raised. Home automation is also about being more eco-friendly. 
So you have the ability to see what is your power consumption. You can also automatically switch lights whenever someone is leaving uh, the room, those kind of things. So it's clear, it's more eco-friendly, but I didn't say that you will make savings because you have to factor in the cost of the home automation setup itself, and uh, in some cases that might be very expensive. So, now if we look at the market, that's a very crowded market. I mean, uh, there's not a single week when uh, the, we don't hear a vendor that is saying that, that is tackling the home automation market. For example, I think that was last week or maybe the week before, Orange in France has said that they will have a no automation offering. And it's a telco provider. Um, Apple is also tackling that market with HomeKit. Uh, Google is, not, is in that market with Nest and so on. So on one hand, it's very nice that we have uh, so many choices. But on the other hand, uh, it's also a drawback because most of those technologies are clearly different. And when it comes to integrate them, well, that's a challenge. And since we are in Belgium, I think that if you take the middle column, except KNX, well, KNX, uh, is, the organization is based in Belgium, but just the technologies that are in the middle are Belgian-based uh, solutions. So you can see that it's really a crowded space, and it's just the beginning. I mean, now you have all heard about the Internet of Things. We have the ability to control any kind of device using a standard Internet protocol. It's really the beginning, so we can expect to, that market to really explode in the coming months and years. Um, how does that work? Well, it's fairly basic. So we have sensors, different type of sensors. So it could be a switch, it could be a motion sensor, a light sensor, a air quality sensor, heat sensors, any kind of sensors. So those are basically input devices, and we'll connect those input devices to output devices, actuators. So, so the actuators will trigger basically the action. So an actuator could be a, a relay that will uh, switch a light on. Um, a relay that will control, well, a driver that will control a motor to close or open a door, those kind of things. So we have input device, we have output device, and we need to have some kind of network in between. Depending on the solution, that, way, that network might be wireless based, it might be wired based, it really depends on which solution you are using. And also, at some point in time, you will also have now, most of the day, some kind of TCP connectivity. I didn't really say internet, I mean, in some cases you will have some kind of REST support, but in some other case, you will have a raw TCP, uh, TCP IP connection that you might want to use. And at the bottom, and it's really where the intelligence of the solution is, we have most of the time a hub, a box, a gateway, a controller. It really depends, but anyway, it's always the same idea. So we have some kind of lightweight computer that provides some uh, added value. So it's basically where you might have the ability to define your scenario. Uh, it's maybe that box, that gateway, that controller, whatever you call it, that you will use to do more advanced stuff, connecting through your home uh, uh, via the internet, those kind of things. And, and really, that box, that gateway, it's really where uh, I think that Java E uh, had a place, had a role to play. So that's where I've been using uh, Java E4, and I will show you how. So when I did... Um, when I started to have that idea about home automation, I looked at the market, which solution should I use? So I did that around, uh, well, that was one year and a half ago, and it was already a crowded space. Uh, since then, more solutions have popped, popped on the market. So I basically had different type of solution, and I picked solution based on my needs. So um, my needs were quite simple. For the old building, which it was basically uh, building from scratch, so I had the ability to do whatever I, I want. But for the existing building, I couldn't afford to uh, have a new bus installed within the walls and so on. So I had to find a solution. So I look at the market and I pick two solutions. And the nice thing is that those two solutions are really uh, different. But I mean really opposite. One is pretty cheap, one is quite more expensive, but more industrial grade, while the other hand is more uh, uh, personal grade, uh, I would say. So the first solution which I've picked is Z-Wave. Um, so they, come, they call themselves the interoperable standard. Um, it's not a standard, it's really a proprietary solution, even if, uh, despite the fact that there is a Z-Wave alliance behind it. So it's a proprietary wireless uh, solution. Um, 
it's a mesh wireless uh, network solution. So that means that we have device and it's a mesh network. So there is a protocol that is able to handle the routing. So I will explain what the, the idea is behind that. So the range uh, is quite limited, 100 feet, but for most of homes, that is quite okay. Obviously, the more you have to cross walls, uh, the more issue you, uh, you will get. But that's where the mesh capabilities of the protocols uh, uh, will help us. We can have something like uh, over 200 modules uh, per controller. So if you, an, if you take any typical home, that is quite okay. And really, the benefit of this wave, uh, despite the fact that it's proprietary, it's cheap and simple. So the principle. I will not go into any details because uh, on the outside, if you look at Z-Wave, that seems uh, fairly easy. Uh, so we have many devices, so wireless devices that you set up in your home. Uh, most of those devices are running on battery. So this is an example of a Z-Wave device. So this is a, a sensor. Uh, it runs for over a year, a year uh, on a battery. So that means that the Z-Wave device spends most of the time in a, sleep, in a sleeping mode. And from time to time, they wake up to see if there is something uh, for, for, the, for himself. So that's something that needs to be handled really at the protocol level. So we have um, a Z-Wave radio, basically. We send the command to the Z-Wave radio, and the Z-Wave radio has to listen to see if there is any device that is awake at that time to send the command that is designed uh, for that particular device. If not, it will have to queue the command until that device uh, woke up. And the nice thing that is handled by the protocol is the fact that, so I need to send a message from here to there, to device, let's say device C, uh, but that device is not inside, so I can't reach physically that device. The fact that uh, the protocol is meshed will allow me to send my message to the final destination through different hopes on the network. And this is something that is handled transparently by the network, so that's not something you have to deal with. You just have to send a command to that device, and the protocol will automatically handle the routing across the different nodes on the network. And this is fully hidden for us. So in terms of connectivity, um, we need to have a Z-Wave radio. Uh, there are various solutions. Uh, there is a USB stick solution. Personally, I'm using a Raspberry Pi with a specific daughter board. It's very cheap. I mean, uh, the daughter board is uh, something like 50 euro. Um, and then, um, I didn't find any Java API to use that uh, solution. So what I did, I picked a Z-Wave middleware that basically ex exposed the Z-Wave command through some kind of REST API. Uh, it's really not REST, but uh, from the outside at least it looks like REST, so we can use it more or less easily. So this is a real-life setup. So uh, Raspberry Pi, we have an input device, which is this, uh, a guy like that. So this is a motion sensor, it has a light sensor, uh, light, a temperature, and a motion detection. Uh, as I said, it runs over a year on, under a single battery. And then we have an output device, that's something that you embed in the walls uh, to trigger, to switch on and off a light, for example. Or you can also use those kind of devices that you plug directly in your wall plugs. So that, as I said, that's a very cheap solution, but it's quite effective. Then I also look at another solution, KNX. Um, it's really the other, side, the other side of the spectrum. So uh, they call themselves the worldwide standard for home and building control. It's really a standard. I mean, there is an ISO-specific standard that defines uh, what KNX is. Um, there are a lot of vendors in that space. So you can really pick and choose solutions from different vendors and combine them together. Um, in terms of media, so uh, Z-Wave is wireless only. In terms of media, uh, KNX works on uh, twisted pair, uh, power line, uh, radio frequencies, so wireless, and IP. In my case, I use, I use the twisted pair. So that's basically a specific uh, bus that I had to install in my house. Then, to do the setup, uh, you need a software which is called ETS, Engineering Tool Software. And just by looking at the name, you can feel that this is a software that has been de designed by engineer for engineer. I mean, maybe it's just, it's just me, but this is a, clearly a super complicated software, well, at least not user-friendly software, that you need to use to do your setup. So that's something that you need to use to install your KNX setup. It's expensive. 
something like 1,000 euro. It only runs on Windows and so on. So it, ha it has all the drawbacks, but still you need to get it. So to work against KNX, uh, we are lucky on the Java side because there is an API which is called Calimero. It's an open source API. And it hides quite a lot of the, well, it abstracts a lot of the KNX uh, dirty details. You still need to understand how KNX works to do that. But at least uh, Calimero simplifies that. And the API is so nice that it's uh, also widely used outside of the Java spaces. So there are solutions that are not Java based that are using uh, Calimero uh, as well. How it works? So in green, we have a KNX bus. So that's a specific bus that you need to install all around your house where you connect all your KNX device. And we'll use uh, ETS at the bottom to configure those devices. So this is the minimal, the minimal setup. So I have a power supply. That's something that is needed to, to power the different device on the bus. I have an input device, which uh, would be something like a switch. And I have an output device. So basically a KNX enabled relay. Then in between, I need to have some connectivity between ETS and my bus. So for that, I'm using a specific uh, IP gateway. So I will use ETS to configure all, all of that. So I will basically assign a kind of address uh, to both devices. And I will say that whenever there is a message sent from that device, I want that guy to listen uh, to that device and react on that. So in terms of cost, this minimal setup is over 200, uh, sorry, 2,000 euro. I mean, ETS, ETS only is 1,000 euro. So KNX is a quite expensive solution. Now you can get rid of that because that's something you use only at the setup. But if you want to add some extra capabilities, uh, you need that controller or that gateway. So you, need st you still need to, to have that IP to KNX uh, gateway. So this is something that looks like that. So it's basically a box that you put in your rack. And it will do the connection, so the mediation between uh, the physical KNX bus and uh, TCP IP. There are other solutions. I mean, you can use USB. Now uh, there is a specific Raspberry Pi on the board and so on. But clearly, this is the most uh, widely used approach. Um, in real life, it looks something like that. So you can see that this is work in progress. Um, to give you an idea, the rack is about one meter high. So uh, if you compare that to Z-Wave, I mean, KNX uh, is clearly more professional industrial grade solution, but it's way more expensive, it's more intrusive, and it's clearly uh, not as simple. So I will not go into details. Uh, but clearly, Z-Wave proprietary, simple, non-intrusive, and cheap, while KNX is a standard. You can have up to uh, 68,000 devices per bus. So this is clearly something that you use when you want to uh, have an automation, well, an automation setup in a uh, complex building, such as hospital, uh, hotels, and so on. But you can also use that for home. This is also a widely used solution. The drawback is that it's complex and it's quite expensive. So now let's look a bit about uh, how Java E fits in that picture. So in my home, I have the two solutions. I have the easy one, Z-Wave wireless solution, and I have KNX, uh, the more industrial great solution. So we have launched uh, Java E7 last year, so the specification was finalized uh, in June. We have introduced quite a few technology. So I asked myself, okay, uh, how Java E would fit in that picture? So if we look on how we have been using Java E uh, since almost the beginning, well, we have been using Java E. Uh, one of the things we have been using Java E for is basically to integrate different types of systems. So database, mainframe, external application, and so on. So since the early day, we have that notion that Java E is able to connect to uh, heterogeneous systems, different type of backend. So clearly, in that picture, Java E has a role to play. Um, there is the connectivity between the controller, so Java e itself, and the client side. So by the client, I really mean the end, use, the end device, so typically a browser that you use on a mobile phone. But Java E is, has also a role to play as the gateway to connect the different type of uh, backend system. In this case, the backend systems, it's Z-Wave on one side and KNX on the other side. Now, if you look at home automation, um, so basically, home automation, you have a 
intelligent home that produce event. And uh, you just have to react on those events. So sometimes it's just notification, you don't have to do some, uh, something, but in most of the time you have to do uh, action based on that. So let's say I trigger a switch, I need to s turn on that specific light, those kind of things. So home automation is highly even uh, driven. So I've looked at how I can basically apply that kind of pattern, pattern using Java E. So in my slide I will show you how I've been using some of the Java E7 API to apply those patterns. So I will, I will go back and forth between connectivity and event handling. But before that, uh, I will spend one minute on JSONP. Uh, so it's an API that we have added to, uh, to EE7, GSR353. It basically uh, gives us the ability to parse and generate uh, JSON from Java in a standard way. I'm mentioning that API because uh, I'm using uh, JSON quite a lot in my application. So it looks like this. So I have this notion of um, notification. So, I have a net so basically, if we make abstraction of Z-Wave and KNX, I have a network of device, input device, output device, and those devices send notification. So it can be automatic notification. So for example, a temperature sensor sends the temperature every uh, 10 seconds but it can be also devices that are triggered. Someone is getting in front of a motion sensor, so we need to do something. So I have this notion, no, this notion of sensor and notification, and basically that's uh, what I'm passing around within my application. So an, another API which I've been used is uh, GSR356, Java API for WebSocket. So in E7, we have introduced uh, this API, so it basically gives us the ability to do uh, bidirectional full duplex communication within uh, Java E. Uh, the nice thing is that WebSocket is part of HTML5. So if you take any HTML5 uh, browser, you will have a JavaScript API that you can use against that API. So the, this API, there is a, a server-side API and a client-side API, and uh, there are two ways to use the API. Uh, a more traditional programmatic approach and an annotation-based approach. This is what I've been using. So we see in this case, so this is a uh, POJO. I'm using the server endpoint annotation to specify to the web container that this should be turned into a WebSocket server endpoint. And then I have the at on open annotation, which is invoked whenever there is a new connection coming in. And what I do whenever that, a new connection coming in, I take that session object, which represents the connection between uh, the server and the new, newly connected client, and I add it to a collection. Then there is that other ev uh, on-event uh, method, which has nothing to do with WebSocket, but in there, there is a send all endpoints method. And if we look at that method, basically what it does, it just uh, send to all the connected endpoints some payload. In this case, this is a notification. So to do that, we just iterate over the collection of uh, session object, get basic remote. So this is the remote endpoint which is connected, and we send it, uh, in this case, some text payload. We could have sent some binary payload, we could have attached encoders, and so on. But that's not something I've done in this case. On the client side, so this is really the browser that I'm using to control and see what is happening. Uh, I'm just using JavaScript. So this is an HTML5 JavaScript API. So um, we set up a new connection, we define an uh, on-message uh, callback, so that callback will be invoked whenever um, there is a new message, and all is done there. Uh, you see that, uh, so this is really uh, low-level JavaScript programming. I didn't use any JavaScript framework, so I'm just ab updating the UI because my focus was really on the back-end side. That's something we'll see on, uh, in the demo. So talking about event, um, in E7 we have introduced CDI 1.1, so context and dependency injection. We have added uh, quite some new features in CDI 1.1, such as two new scope and so on. And clearly, CDI has been introduced in ES6. It's a fairly young uh, technology. Uh, I mean, if you look at the Java e, uh, history, that's a fairly um, young technology. But CDI is really becoming the core component model of uh, Java e. So that's an important technology. So what I've been using uh, CDI for is uh, for an event mechanism that is there in CDI since uh, CDI 1.0. So that is something that is present since the beginning. And it's a fairly easy to use uh, event mechanism that gives you a clear separation between the event producer and the event consumer. 
So you don't have to hard code any kind of listener and so on. This is a very clean uh, approach. How it works? So on the produ producing side, so this is an event producer. I'm injecting uh, through CDI some kind of event that I'm defining. So I have some event. And then whenever I want to send an event, I'm just do a some event fire and then I attach some payload to it. On the receiving side, so on the consuming side, um, we just need to use the at observe annotation, so we decorate a method with that specific annotation, and that method will be invoked whenever the fire at the top uh, is invoked. And this is very practical. I can do uh, that kind of things. So this is of some kind of KNX listener. I will explain that uh, later. And whenever that listener is invoked, so whenever that uh, handle KNX sensor callback is invoked, I'm just firing an event. And somewhere else in my application, I have uh, that on event method that I mentioned earlier. Uh, so re really here, here I'm back to connectivity. And this is uh, basically used to uh, send notification to the connected uh, endpoints. So this is basically how I update the browser which are connected. So, so whenever someone is triggering a switch on Kinex, there is that event that is fired and uh, all the connected browser uh, have in real time see the value uh, through that mechanism. So it gives us a clear separation between the event consumer and the event producer. So talking about connectivity, JAXRS2. So in ES7 we have introduced JAXRS2. So it was an important revamp of the JAXRS specification. Um, improvements around uh, filters, interceptors, asynchronous capabilities, hypermedia, uh, and so on. One of the things we have added also in JAXRS2 is a client API. So we finally have a standard client API that we can use. Um, one of the misconceptions about that, and this is also true for WebSocket, is the fact that people think that, okay, this is a client API, so this is something that we should use on the client side. Yes, but a server, I mean a Java container, can also be a client of another backend system. So we can obviously use that API on the backend side as well. Uh, this is what I've been doing. So I've been using uh, the JAXRS client API on my Java container uh, to basically connect to the Z-Wave uh, middleware. Um, so you see how it works, it's fairly easy, so we just need to have a, a client instance that we get through that client builder, new client uh, call. Then we just need, as we would do on the backend side, we just need to basically construct the request. So we set the target, we set the request, and uh, we uh, do the request. Now, um, a drawback, in, at least in the home automation space, is that a lot of solution claims to be uh, REST or internet enabled. Uh, in this case, uh, this was clearly not REST, but I mean the API is quite flexible, so I, I was able to use it against that non-REST uh, API. But in some case, I mean, I've used a solution that uh, to work on, well, they didn't have the notion of resources, but I mean, if you make abstraction of that, to work against something, sometimes you have to do a connection on a specific port using HTTP, and if you want to do something else on that same kind of resources, you have to do another connection on a different port. So clearly this is a rest fish uh, at best. So I've been using REST, uh, the client-side API, but obviously uh, I'm also using a JAX REST to expose all my resources, um, so the KNX and the Z-Wave resources um, as uh, REST resources. So I'm also using obviously the, tra the more traditional uh, client si uh, server-side API, sorry. So I guess that you know all how it works, so uh, I set uh, the path, in this case this is a put. Um, I'm using template, so the ID and the value will be resolved whenever there is a connection and so on. And typically most of those features are also av available on the client API. So, uh, whenever you have the ability to use REST to integrate uh, Backend such as Z-Wave uh, use REST, but in some cases you don't have uh, that uh, flexibility. So there comes GCA, Java Connector Architecture 1.7. So GCA uh, defined a Java e component model that that is used to connect 
uh, Java E to external resources in a safe way. So by external resources, it, it's basically it can be uh, some kind of database, some kind of external application, and so, and so on. So uh, GCA defines a specific component model, a resource adapter, sometimes called a uh, connector, and that's basically that component that will do the mediation between the Java E world, so the Java E container, and the external world. And there are a few contracts that are defined for GCA, but GCA is also more flexible in terms of um, what we can do within the GCA components, in terms of trading, in terms of uh, TCP, of socket connection, and so on. So, um, this is how it works. So, we have the Java E application. We need to have a specific resource adapter or a connector. And there are two, mod two modes for that uh, API. There is an outbound mode and there is an inbound mode. At the end of the day, it's always the Java E side that set up the connection. So, it's Java E that, that set the connection to the external system. So, this is done through the resource adapter. But once this is done, the behavior is different. So for outbound, it's basically a request response pattern. So Java E sends a request to the external systems and it will get some kind of response. In inbound, this is different. Java E set up the connection and from time to time, we will get in an asynchronous way a notification from the external systems. So We'll look at one of those two models, that's the inbound model. And the inbound model, I'm pretty sure that uh, most of you have already used that. Uh, we use the, that inbound model when, whenever we use uh, MDB, message-driven bin. So this is uh, an MDB, a typical MDB, so a typical GMS MDB. So we use the at message-driven annotation. We use the activation spec to configure um, through the resource adapter the resources. Then uh, we have my GMS MDB which needs to implement that mes message listener interface. Then we define a callback on messages and so on. So this is something that we have been doing. But if we look at the spec, uh, I've, so this is some abstract from the spec. So an MDB is an asynchronous uh, message consumer. MDB is sent to inbound resource adapter, and so on. So today we are most of the time using MDB for GMS, but clearly there is nothing that ties uh, MDB to GMS. I mean, we can also use MDB for something else. And that's what I have done. So this is a KNX uh, MDB. So this is same signature, so at message driven. I'm using the activation spec uh, to configure my KNX resource adapter. Uh, I have to admit that uh, I don't have a lot of stuff to configure. I just need to configure the IP, but still. Uh, and then uh, my Canix MDB implement a Canix listener, and I have that callback on messages. Um, so this is the easy side. I mean, uh, the complicated side is really done within the resource adapter. So this is another uh, KNX MDB. This is something which is possible since uh, Java 7. So um, now we have the ability to have a different listener, well, a, a listener that is different, and uh, we have the ability to have different methods that will be invoked. And basically, I'm using an annotation to basically do the routing between the two methods. So this is a KNX MDB. Depending on the payload that is sent uh, from the KNX bus, uh, if it's a sensor, it will go to the handle KNX sensor. If it's a switch, it will go to the switch KNX uh, method. So, to do that, obviously, we have to develop the resource adapter. So, um, we need um, to define the listener interface. This is uh, very easy. And clearly, the, 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 well, most of the work is done in the uh, resource adapter implementation itself. So we need to do quite a few things. But the nice thing is that within that component model, we have the ability to do uh, things such as handling our own socket connection if we need to. Then um, we also need to have an implementation of the activation specs. So that's basically some sort of bins that will be used to pass the settings uh, from the application uh, to the resource adapter to configure the connection to the external backend systems. 
And um, yeah, something that is not on my slide, I'll, we also need to define that uh, specific Kinex annotation. So um, endpoint activation is called whenever we deploy or we start the resource adapter. Uh, if we look at there, there are, at the code, there are two methods which are quite important. Um, there is this find command in MDB, and there is the, at the end uh, where we actually uh, do the actual work. So the find command in MDB is really a kind of uh, some, well, intelligent router might be an expensive terms, but it's really where we do um, basically the switching between the different methods we have. So it gets the actual MDB class, and it scans the class uh, to see which method have been annotated with that uh, specific Kinex annotation. And based on that, it will invoke the right uh, MDB uh, method. So it's some sort of uh, dynamic dispatcher. Now, in the resource adapter, we also need to implement the actual uh, physical connectivity uh, to the, in this case, the Kinex bus. So for that, I've, I've used the Calimero API. So this is really more uh, traditional uh, uh, Calimero code. The only thing which is very specific is more at the end. So I have a listener. I get uh, some payload from the Kinex bus. Uh, the Calimero API uh, gives me some kind of uh, abstraction uh, of that. But I still need to understand Kinex, and I still need to understand what the payload is to do some uh, smart decision on that. For example, if I want to do routing between a uh, payload that is coming from a sensor or from a switch, I need to understand what is being sent to me. So this is what I'm doing here. So I have that specific Kinex address, which is a device on the bus, and I know that that address is a humidity sensor. So based on that, I can do whatever I need to do. So um, something we obviously need to do is to define the the Kinex uh, annotation itself. And this is really the easy part. Once we have done that, yeah, no, sorry, I forgot to mention. Um, the, so the, the, the message, the, the MDB will be invoked by the resource adapter through a, a proxy that will, it will get, that will be generated, sorry, uh, by the container. So this is that command.invoke MDB, and we have the ability to, send it, to pass it some uh, parameters. So once we have done that, uh, well, that was really, really a difficult part. We can have that kind of code, which is, I mean, relatively clean. So we can listen on a KNX bus and get notification from the bus and do whatever we, we need to do. Uh, obviously, this is only inbound. So if we want to send uh, information to the bus, so if fr from Java e we want to turn on a light, for example, or open a window, uh, close the door, those kind of things, we need to do the on connection as well. So I will not cover um, outbound because uh, clearly the outbound API is a bit, uh, well, I would say dusty, and it's, uh, I would say, relatively complicated. But I had to, to do it because uh, clearly I wanted to get notification from the KNX bus, but I also want to control the KNX bus. So, I've been using JAXRS, I've been using uh, GCA to basically integrate different types of backend. So whenever you have the ability to stick to JAXRS, that's really easy, but uh, sometimes you don't have that possibility. So that's where uh, GCA uh, is handy. So before I show you the demo, um, there are a lot of other stuff that I could do, and some of those I plan to do. Uh, for example, I could use a JAXRS interceptor. I can also use CDI interceptors. So the idea, for example, w uh, would be that uh, whenever um, a light is switched on, uh, I, might want to, I might want to automatically switch that light off after 30, seconds, uh, 30 minutes. This is called staircase light. I can do that using uh, interceptors and so on. So in Java E, there are a lot of extra capabilities and extra API uh, that might make sense in that scenario. But clearly, at the beginning, Java E wasn't designed really for that space. But if we look at the flexibility that we, that we have in the platform, it also makes sense uh, to do that. So, the demo. So this is the demo I, I will show you. Um, obviously, uh, I didn't bring my home with me. Um, so I did that demo uh, at Java 1 live. 
So basically, I have a, a, a web application, and I'm connecting to my home, my home office, and I'm controlling different type of device through KNX, through Z-Wave. Uh, I'm doing action based on uh, notification and so on. So let's look at the slide of the setup. It looks uh, quite busy. So this is basically what I've shown you at the beginning, and really uh, the Java E part is here. So I'm using Java E to uh, talk in both directions uh, to the Kinex bus. So I have inbound and outbound connection. I'm using Java E to talk in both directions to Z-Wave, so I can send command to the Z-Wave network, so wireless, the wireless network, but I also get notification from the Z-Wave network. So it's really bidirectional connection. And obviously, as soon as I have a notification that is within my Java E container, I can do whatever I want with it. So at Java 1, I connected through VPN to my home. I had a, um, a webcam set up. I did my session, I think, uh, so I live in Belgium, so uh, around, well, it was uh, more or less end of the day, uh, so I basically connected live to my home. Uh, it was something like four in the morning. I told my wife I would do that, but uh, she was a bit freaked out because, uh, well, it was, so, so the issue is that basically when you do, when you control some switch, uh, there are some relays in that big rack that do some noise, and the door wasn't closed at that time. So she heard that noise, and then she saw some light coming from the stairs that were going on and so on, so she was a bit... <laughs> no, but really. The good thing is that my daughter didn't notice anything. So, let's see. Oops, let's see. So this is a recording, uh, enter full screen, yes. So this is running on Glassfish 4. Yeah, sorry. So uh, what I'm doing here, I'm starting uh, Glassfish. So I have two applications deployed. One is really the, um, the application that is controlling everything, and the other one is just a pure web app. Uh, so a few, uh, few JavaScript files and some HTML. So I'm just grabbing uh, the logs to see what's happening. So now I'm connecting to the Glassfish uh, console to actually start the home automation application. So the application is deployed, but it's not started. And I will do a post to see the logs. So the traffic, yeah, that one. So as soon as we deploy that, the resource adapter, uh, sorry, as soon as we start it, the resource adapter is trying to connect to the bus. So we see there trying to connect to the KNX bus. And uh, the middle, we see that the resource adapter was able to connect uh, to the bus. So that means that we have a connection to the bus. And it, this is inbound. So we already see that we have notification coming in from the KNX bus. So we can see that it's KNX just by looking at the address. So 119 looks like a KNX address. Uh, and for example, this is a humidity sensor, so it sends the humidity level uh, that it detects. Uh, there is another one, uh, 119, no, sorry, it's this, uh, no, sorry. It's, this is the same sensors, but it's a humidity, temperature, and a CO, uh, so air quality sensors. So it sends different values. So all those notifications, I got them on the Java side through uh, MDB. So now I will use the client application. So again, this is just uh, HTML and JavaScript. So what we have here, we basically have all the device that I have in my uh, home office that you see there. So it's basically Z-Wave and KNX device. So you can tell that it's a Z uh, KNX device when the address is very short. And for example, this is a Z-Wave device. Um, when there is a, a switch, it's basically a device that you can control. So all the others are basically uh, uh, sensors. So I'm sending basically here what I'm doing. I'm, so 
that was that light who was uh, freaking my wife. So what I'm doing here, so I have a web browser. I, send, I just send uh, REST calls to the Java backend. And depending on the target, so if it's a KNX device, uh, the Java container, so the Java application will send a command uh, using the resource adapter to the KNX bus, so to the, using the outbound resource adapter. If it's just a Z-Wave device, it will use the JAXRS client to send um, a Z-Wave command to the Z-Wave stack. So this is, uh, also you can, you can notice that sometimes I give uh, names to my lights. Um, this is, uh, so plug stairs. So this is basically a KNX plug. So in the world there is a plug and it's controlled by KNX. And that Bourrelet light is basically uh, a light that is controlled using uh, those kind of plugs. So this is a Z-Wave plugs, a wireless Z-Wave plugs. So I have the ability to control all the device uh, within my home, and at some point in time, we, we should also get some notification. Yeah, we can see, for example, that. So, here uh, we have the temperature, so 24 degree. So, uh, uh, in this case, this is a Z-Wave. Sorry, this is a Kinex notification push uh, to, uh, to Java E through using um, MDB, and from there, it's pushed to the client using uh, WebSocket. So something else that I've done is some kind of basic rules. Uh, so I will, I think it's here, I'm la switching on everything. And you can see that, so, the, so there is a, a, a light here. You can see that it's still work in progress because there is just the wire going out of the wall. And I've put uh, behind uh, a camera uh, stand with a Z-Wave light sensor. And the idea is that whenever uh, the light will reach a certain uh, threshold, uh, I want to do something. And in this case, the thing I want to do is switch off that light. So this is control. So this is an if a, a command that we send through uh, KNX, so GCA. We'll get a notification from Z-Wave, so uh, through uh, the JAXRS stack. And we'll send, in this case, another command to uh, 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 using Z-Wave, but it could have been uh, um, uh, KNX. So you should watch here, because that's, that guy, the luminosity sensor is here. So I'm lighting the light, I'm switching the light that is behind, we don't really see it, and then the wall desk. And you see, as soon as I light that one, you see that uh, that luminosity level went over 1,000 lux, so that's the trigger, and we need to switch off the light. Uh, you see that we didn't get any notification before. Why? Because, as I told you, this is a wireless device that runs uh, most of the time. Um, so we configure the device whenever to, to tell the device when it needs to send a notification. So in this case, I, I just configured the sensor to say that, okay, when uh, the... Um, the, 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 the delta between the current light and the, well, the previous light and the current light is that high, you send me a message. So, um, yeah, so that's basically, uh, yeah, so light wall desk, so, uh, yeah, so, yeah. So I will switch that one on again. So the, the, light, the current light level uh, is 19, so this is very low. Then I'm switching that one on. And if, as soon as I send, switch that one off, on, sorry, that one will be automatically switched off. So. So wrap up. So I've been using Java E uh, in a non-traditional enterprise context. I've used JAXRS, GCA, and WebSocket. I've also used some of the event-driven capabilities that are in the platform, such as MDB and CDI. But there is more in the platform that we can use. I mean, uh, we have a single blocking I/O. Uh, 
Right now, I'm also using the scaling capability of the platform, for example, to automatically turn line on at specific time and so on. There is way more in the platform that might make sense. So what's next? Well, if we look at what we plan to do around Java E, there are a lot of improvements that might be uh, useful in my cases. For example, in GMS, uh, to one, the MDB uh, models will be revamped. So how it will apply to this, I'm not sure, but that's something that would be interesting. If we look at CDI 2.0, the event model will be completely uh, revamped as well. We'll have the ability to set uh, priority on event. So that's something that uh, might be very useful in the long run. So right now, What's next for my application? This is just a proof of concept. It works in production in my home. Uh, I'm supporting KNX Z-Wave in infrared, so I have the ability to control those kind of devices. And I plan to add extra protocols, such as RF4233, for example. This is a specific wireless protocol uh, that is useful in some cases. I plan to add more types, because right now uh, I just get the value of sensors, and uh, I just uh, support basically a Boolean uh, value, so I can switch light on and off, but I do have lights that have dim, uh, dimming capabilities, so I want to set a light just to, let's say, 75%, those kind of things, so I just need to enhance that. State management is also something I plan to do. By that I mean that uh, the application needs to query the network, so through KNX and Z-Wave, to know in which state uh, each device, what, what is the state of all the device? Is it on, is it off, and so on, those kind of things. So, before I take questions, if you want to learn, more, to learn more about those API, check the Java E7 tutorial. Uh, it covers all the API, including GCA. And finally, if you want runtime for that, all of that is running on Glassfish 4.1. This is just Java E7 uh, code, so it should run on any Java E7 compatible application server. So with that, we have a few minutes uh, for questions. So is there any questions, remarks? Yes. Is the code available? So uh, I'll repeat the question. So is the code available? Uh, not yet. So it was a proof of concept. If there is interest, uh, shoot me a mail on Twitter, at uh, double S double E, and I will uh, clean that code first, and then uh, I will put it on the outside. Is there any? Yes. You mentioned in uh, one of the first slides that you can also connect to the smart meter. So yeah. So the question is about uh, power consumption, right? Yeah. Can you connect to the smart meter? Uh, so the question: Can I connect to the smart meter in my home? No, because I don't have a smart meter. But. Uh, I have, so if you look at th those kind of uh, 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 KNX switch, some of those that I'm using are able, whenever I switch them on, they are able to tell me how much current is drawn on that specific uh, port. So uh, until I have a smart meter, I have a solution to do that. And, but that's something I haven't looked at it yet. But technically, I should be able to do that. It's just a different type of message. So I need to send a KNX command to get the value, and then I'm done. Any other questions? I don't, well, I don't really see, so uh, no. Okay, thanks a lot.